Many thanks for your time here on the Midday News. Our very first story this afternoon and Pressure Group Alliance for Accountable Governance, AFAG, has given government a four-week ultimatum to further reduce petroleum prices or risk a nationwide protest. Now, the group says it will, in the coming days, embark on a series of radical measures uh, should government refuse to heed its call for a reduction in fuel prices. The prices of petroleum products have been reduced by between 2% and 4% on the same day that transport fares went up by some 15%. But AFAC says the reduction is unsatisfactory. Apir Tuankra is vice chair of the Alliance for Accountable Governance. Look, we've been in touch with uh, some experts in the petrol industry. I mean, uh, uh, crude oil industry. And we are being told that what the government has done is nothing but a mockery of what is supposed to be done to us. So that is why we are pressing that. So from where you sit, and based on the consultations you've had with uh, the experts you speak of, how much are we supposed to pay for a gallon of fuel? We haven't done that, but the reduction that can be given to us is between 6% and 10%, minimum of 6%. So you would have been okay if government had announced that there was going to be a 6% reduction in fuel prices? Uh, absolutely, between 6% and 6%. 10%. Percent. Now, I would say between 4% and 6%, really, there isn't so much gap. So if government has already made an intervention and you are enjoying between 2% and 4% reduction, uh, I mean, why don't you give government some time? Probably it might increase as, as time goes on. You see, my, 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 the, the, the issue is with the attendant... Uh, uh, pressure that is being brought on the Ghanaian, right? Electricity is gone up, water is gone up, okay? Transport fares gone up again. And once you touch these things, other people will find a means of paying. So today, we are hearing that rent is gone up mm. because the landlords are also wanting to get something to pay for the electricity bills and water bills. Okay, so, Mr. Anka, uh, again, I was looking at the statement you released uh, a while ago, um, uh, yesterday, I must say, and uh, it talks also of uh, the transport uh, transport fare increases and all. Now, uh, we are told that the components that go into increasing transport fares here in the country are not just fuel. Quite a number of other things uh, play a role. So, indeed, if you are calling for a reduction in transport fares as well, one would say, really, the dynamics are not really the same. Sure. The, the, what the transport people are also telling us is that for, for some time now, they've been, as it were, uh, forced not to increase. Their, uh, the, so now they are feeling the pain. So if the government is able to jack up, you know, the percentage of uh, uh, increase that they've done, they will also consider reducing their first. Okay. So what is AFAG essentially going to do now? Are you going to embark on a strike? Or a demonstration? Well, per, per, well, really, what, what are you going the, to do? Yeah, per the, this thing that, that we issued out to government, which we have sent to them, we've said that, look, these things, it takes time to discuss with the transport and other uh, sectors. So we're giving them four weeks, between four weeks and six weeks to organize themselves. And You're reduce. giving government a, a four-week ultimatum, is that what you said? Absolutely. So okay. that we're, we're going to have some mass actions ac across the country. Let's now turn our attention to Parliament and addressing Parliament today, the Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi called for the creation of greater opportunities for the youth to address human trafficking and illegal migration. Praising Ghana for her democratic credentials, the Prime Minister told Parliament that protecting human rights should be the priority for governments around the world. Elton Brobe is joining his parliamentary correspondent and he joins us on the line with a live update on what is currently going on in Parliament. So, Elton, good afternoon, many thanks for your time. Now, what were the highlights of the Prime Minister's address? I think uh, basically to, uh, the, the address was to sell, uh, for want of a better word, Italy's foreign policy to Ghana and the, the whole of Africa because it's been on a tour of the African continent. And in Parliament today, uh, he spoke about uh, uh, joining forces with African leaders, uh, African leaders to fight terrorism, uh, because according to him, uh, uh, the, the new wave uh, uh, threat from ISIL and other uh, terrorist groups cannot influence the way of life of the world. 
and therefore leaders are, around the world should come together with the United Front to fight this growing you know, menace. He also spoke about Ghana's uh, democratic credentials, praising the country for high democratic uh, credentials in Africa, which is an envy not only in Africa but around the world. And he was particularly happy with the fact that here in Ghana, the government and the opposition parties, you know, collaborate, even though they may differ on, 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 on policies and issues. Uh, he, you know, praised both the minority and the majority uh, for the work they've done together in ensuring that Ghana's democracy is respected by all across the world. But in terms of what Italy and Ghana will do together under his leadership as prime minister, he said that he will deepen collaboration with Ghana uh, in the areas of energy, agribusiness, uh, es uh, cultural exchange. Remember that he and I, which is an Italian company, has made some discoveries in the Sankofa fields, and he told Parliament, and indeed after his presentation, he told the media that uh, he and I will work together with Ghana to ensure that the energy potentials in the country are realized. On the agribusiness, he said that Italy, they have vast experience in, in, in agriculture, and you will hope that under his leadership, he will collaborate more with Ghana to ensure that we add value to our agricultural products. On the issue of the youth, he spoke about the need for job opportunities to be created for the youth on the African continent, especially when many have wrecked their lives, many have died in their attempt to cross over uh, to Italy. Because Italy has been uh, the receiving point for many you know, uh, migrants who want to uh, get better life elsewhere. He says that he, they are working together with African leaders, but the need for African leaders to create that enabling environment, that opportunity for the African youth to stay here in Africa and work is paramount because they respect the dignity of the human. So basically, these mm -hmm. are the highlights of the things that you've been telling Parliament in its 15 minutes, you know, address. Indeed. But w what has been the reaction from parliamentarians uh, to most of the things he said so far? All those I spoke to from both sides of the House uh, were of the view that, you know, human trafficking indeed uh, ensuring that the African youth is able to get something to do after the completion of school. Uh, uh, they, they were of the view that it's something that they will carry it on with government to ensure that enough job opportunities are created for the African youth. Indeed, some members on the, on the ruling government said that under the youth employment agencies, government is expecting to create about 100,000 jobs for the youth. So going forward, they have the view that with, with these interventions coming up in this year, uh, job opportunities will be made available for the teaming youth in this country. But those on the minorities are of the view that uh, the future of the youth looks quite bleak under this particular government, and for that reason, government should take a cue from the address delivered by the Italian Prime Minister and ensure that jobs are created because an unemployed youth may be a threat to the security of the nation, something that they don't want to experience in the country. Indeed, indeed, Elton, many thanks for your time. But uh, is there any other thing happening in Parliament today? The House is on suspension for now. Okay. Uh, the Speaker has allowed for an, a one-hour break. When they return, there are issues. We expect the Finance Committee to present a report on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2016. The aim of the bill is to remove the 1% tax government introduced uh, on interest and on investment. Remember that government has already uh, written to Parliament and they followed it up with a bill. The Finance Committee will present their report and then in their report, they will make the case for the bill to be taken under a certificate of agency because of the issues surrounding it. But all that will happen when the House returns to the chamber. Okay. Many thanks for that particular update. Parliamentary correspondent Elton Brobe joining us with a lot more on that particular visit by the Italian Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, who addressed Parliament a while ago. Well, uh, sometime last night, he held bilateral talks on areas of mutual interest with His Excellency John Dramani Mama, the Prime Minister. Uh, who arrived on Monday evening, met with the president at the Flagstaff House and held the first round of meetings. President John Romani Mahama and Matteo Renzi later on briefed the press on ways that two countries can collaborate, especially in the areas of agriculture and immigration. During this visit, I drew an invitation to Prime Minister Renzi to pay a reciprocal visit to Ghana, and I'm happy to note that he has fulfilled his promise. I'm delighted, Mr. Prime Minister, that six months after that meeting in Romeo and Accra, 
to see to the consolidation of our common positions and the key roadmaps that we discussed while I was in Rome. Our discussions tonight have been far reaching and the bilateral issues have been well positioned. At the end of 2015, Italy had 118 projects registered in Ghana in the areas of manufacturing, construction, and the services sector. Key among these is the 7 billion Italian ENI investment in our hydrocarbon sector, and which to date represents the biggest single investment in this country. The ENI and Vitor project would complement government's effort at addressing the current energy needs of Ghana and the rest of the West African sub-region. Your Excellency, is the presence of a large number of Italian companies which are doing very well too in Ghana underlines the critical relationship between our two countries. One of the key issues in my discussions with Prime Minister Renzi has been Italy's support for the development of small and medium-scale enterprises in Ghana and the introduction of Italy's well-tested, renowned quality tomato production technology. And I said uh, during our discussion that if there are any two things, Ghanaians and Italians share in common, is that we put tomato in everything, in soups, stews, everything. I have on behalf of the government and people of Ghana expressed gratitude to the government of Italy for the support extended to the Ghana private sector development facility. We believe in some values, uh, in some ideals very important. Uh, we think uh, necessary uh, the, the, the share of some uh, economic initiatives. Uh, Mr. President, you remember the very important initiative of ENI here. There is the CEO of ENI, Claudio Descalzi, and uh, I think the plan of investments uh, of ENI in Ghana is one of the most powerful investment uh, of uh, ENI in this uh, in this uh, period despite oil price uh, we continue to invest in Africa in particular in Ghana but we we must uh, uh, invest a lot of time and money in every sector also tomatoes and uh, uh, every because it's important uh, agriculture is abs I agree with the president because we discussed about only uh, only Mr. President and myself. Uh, You're still watching news today here on your Joe News Channel here on Multi TV. We we'll return shortly with some more news. Don't go away. Many thanks for staying with us here on News Today to some more stories. Now let's turn our attention to security this time round. And the Greater Accra Police Commanders today meeting leaders of political parties to discuss ways to ensure that the November 7 polls are devoid of violence. The Regional Police Commander DCOP Dr. George Dampare earlier led a delegation of senior police officials to the regional headquarters of the New Patriotic Party. This continuous engagement process or system that we have introduced is something that we want it to be rare time so that our engagement will be on minute by minute basis for all the political parties so that at the end of the day out of that we'll be able to have what we call an early warning policing system in order to identify problems and deal with them before they become something beyond us. So today we are here as a follow-up to that continuous engagement process with all stakeholders who have something to do with these elections. We will be visiting all the political parties in their office. And therefore, we are here with my officers to make history and to change the dynamics of police-political party relationship in our beloved country. Arguably, this is the first time that you have political police officers at the office of political party not to come and maintain law and order or to effect a race for a breach of law, but to come and build dynamic partnership and break 
the perceived animosity between police and political parties. Well, my colleague Ivy Jemfi is with the police as they make their rounds and joins us with a live update of, of uh, what is currently going on now. So Ivy, good afternoon. Many thanks if you can hear me. Now, well, uh, we, we have heard the message from the police to the New Patriotic Party and indeed to all the uh, political parties they've been visiting. Really, what has been the reaction from these parties? So far, we visited just the, um, the NPP regional headquarters and... They've welcomed the police visit and the, uh, um, the, uh, they've welcomed the, uh, the police, the police, um, the reason the police came there, they are welcoming the purpose. They are, they are all for peace and they are ready to cooperate with the police to ensure peace and sanity during this um, 2016 election. Mm, indeed, indeed. So wh wh where else are you expected to visit this afternoon? We are expecting to go to the, we just left the MPP office, we'll be going to the NBC and I'm sure we'll be going to the CPP and other political um, headquarters. Okay, many thanks for your time on news today. That was uh, my colleague and reporter Ivy Jamfi who joined us live there from the regional office of the New Patriotic Party here in the greater Accra region. We can now do a lot more stories this time round. We can turn our attention to transports and uh, transport unions in the country. Well, on Monday, February 8, embark on an indefinite strike over insurance premiums. Now, the group say the move is based on the National Insurance Commission's decision to impose a 500% increment in motor insurance premiums. My colleague Anodame was at a media briefing by the groups this morning and uh, well, she'll be joining me pretty shortly with a lot more on what really transpired over there at that particular meeting. But before we have Anodame on that particular story, let's move on and do a few more stories. Now, uh, some teacher trainees who graduated last year from a private training college say they are jobless six months after completing school. Now, the teacher trainees from St. Ambrose College of Education in Doma, Akwemo, in the Bonawafu region claim all efforts to get employment have proved futile, though their colleagues from public institutions have been employed by the Ghana Education Service. They have been sharing their story with my colleague, F Felix Akoya. We graduated from last year, that is July 2015, and... We were promised, like our principal have worked through the regional to the national level, that's Ghana Education Service as well as the Ministry of Education with respect to our postings. And he was given the assurance that once the 2016 budget is approved by parliament, we'll be given the clearance to go and serve. And we have wait, wait, waited till January 2016 now, and we have not heard anything from the government. We have, our principal have been making the effort to the various stakeholders to find out why the delay in the clearance, but that have proved futile. And we have also taken it upon ourselves to find out why. So today we went to the Ministry of Education and were directed to the Ghana Education Service that they deal, they deal with what postings. And when we went there, the same old story, that clearance. We went back to Ministry of Finance, they are in charge of signing the clearance. And to our dismay, when, I went, when we went there, no one was ready to speak to us. So we didn't know why we are being treated like that. Once we are citizens of Ghana, our parents pay tax. And our parents paid our fees and everything. Our colleagues are the government sector. The government sponsored their education. And they have completed. And the government have posted them. And as for us, they say we should sit and wait for clearance. While the government side, they are in, the, they are in active service. So we want to petition, we want to plead to the various stakeholders concerning this matter that if it is from the government, from GES or whatever it is, they should hear our plea and work on it for us. That has been our major concern. So um, how many of you have not been employed now as we speak? As we speak now, we are 254 graduates. From your school? From yeah. our college. But we are other sister colleges too who, have, who are also going through the same challenge. Oh. It is very hectic, in fact. So my major concern is that the government should listen to our prayers and our cry because we are really suffering in the house. Being in the house for all this while, it's not an easy. So we are pleading to the government that he should listen to our cry. We are also Ghanaians. Our mothers have paid taxes, so at least.
So let's go back to that earlier story I spoke to you about, and it has to do with transport unions in the country who will on Monday, February 8th, embark on an indefinite strike over insurance premiums. Now, the group say the move is based on the National Insurance Commission's decision to impose a 500% increase in uh, motor insurance premiums. My colleague Hanno Dame was at a media briefing by the groups this morning and joins us with a lot more on what transpired. So Hannah, many thanks for joining us. Indeed, uh, they're saying they're going to embark on a demonstration. Yeah. No, a, a strike. A, a strike. Yeah. So give us their reasons, really. You know, let me go back, flashback. Sure. Last year, mm -hmm. there was a meeting with the finance ministry as well as um, the National Insurance Association. Yeah. And the outcome was that the drivers who were paying 150% on their premium, yeah. that's for third party, will be increased to 400%. They disagreed. So there was a back and forth like negotiations, and then it came to 200 and between 250 to 260 percent. So that was a compromise. That was that was the decision okay. that was made. They will pay the first tranche this year, and then the next next year. Now the drivers are saying that this year they've been told instead of paying between 250 to 260 percent, they will have to pay 500 percent. 500. That's even an increment from the first one, which was 400 percent. And so uh -huh. they do not understand. They are saying that. They want the regulators to go back to the revision table, mm -hmm. to the negotiation table, decide what they really have to pay because there was a conclusion. They don't know why a new decision has been made without their knowledge. Okay. And they have to pay for it. They will not pay the 500. Some of them have been pushed to pay because they necessarily have to do it. Mm -hmm. But they are saying that by February 8th, they are giving the Transport Ministry, National Insurance Commission, and the MPA up to the end of this weekend. If they do not reduce the third party premium insurance, they are going to embark on the indefinite, well, not an indefinite, a one day strike, okay. which they believe will make so much impact. This is Charles Danso. He is the chairman of the Commuter, Commuter Drivers Privacy. Association. Okay. This strike is to the insurance commission and they will definitely reduce it. If they will not reduce it, we drivers will form our own insurance. That's what we want to tell them. That is the point that we are going to form our own, our own insurance. I'm not sure about that. I'm very sure. That's after the day strike in, on February 8th. We are going to, ah, madam, we are going to register our own insurance. <laughs> so that's the signal I'm telling them. We will do it. I'm not someone who will say something which I will not do. We, we are on it. It's like a timing bomb. So they should be aware. Okay. It's um, your other sister organizations, GPRTU and GRC, TCC, part of it. They are aware. You see, we don't have a driver called uh, GPRTU. GPRTU. We, ha we don't have an uh, car owner called GPRTU or GRTCC. We are all car owners and drivers. So this, this uh, news or this uh, message goes to every driver in Ghana. If you are from Burkina and you are you are being stressed of this problem, you are you are joined. You have to join this uh, strike action. So it's going everywhere. We don't have GPITU driver. I'm Charles Down, so I'm not gonna committed. Okay, so that was uh, Charles Danso. He's a member of the Committed Taxi Drivers Association here in Ghana. I still have with me my colleague, Anodami, who was at the media briefing and uh, is giving us a lot more as to what really happened. So, uh, essentially, that's his point. That's what exactly. he's been saying. So, this strike action they're talking of, this one day strike, really, uh, do they even think it's going to have any impact? Exactly. Um, they are saying that they held one last year and there was their response was enormous because especially those from the harbors, you know, they have to come sell their fish and all of that. Mm. They know that as a result of that, they're going to be listened to and their threats, if I should put it that way, is going to be responded to adequately. Now they said that if their request is not heeded to, they're going to form their own insurance company. Mm. So yes, I don't know how. Uh, uh, yeah. Really. I asked and they said we should wait because right now they are sitting on a time bomb if by Monday the regulators do not listen to their plea and reduce the premiums, they're going to form their own insurance company. They've put everything in place already. Oh. And we should just wait and see. Wow.
Yeah. So uh, we can take a listen to them as well. Not that one for now. Okay, <laughs> okay. Let's let's watch that but, on the polls. Okay, but we are also told uh, that aside this, they've also been uh, speaking of issues relating to the transport fare hikes and all, and how they are handling such things. Really, what have they been saying? Yes, um, the vice per, uh, the vice chairman, uh, who is Prince Amankwa, said that if anybody has any issues, they should go to Mutisasaga because. Initially, whenever there is transport uh, increment, what they do is they will tell us exactly how much you have to pay from one point exactly. to the other. Say you are in Adenta, mm. from Joy, Kokomlimli to Adenta, you pay 20 cities with a taxi. Now, if there's an increment, 15%, probably they calculate and they give you specific amounts so okay. that you are not doing your own calculation. The driver is also doing his own calculation. Then you sit in the taxi and there's a, the rage and all the conflict. They don't want the percentage. They want the exact figures that passengers will have to be paid to be made public before it's even announced so that the conflict is reduced. So they do not blame themselves. They will do as much education as they can for their passengers. Okay. But if you have a problem, they say go to Moses Asaga's office. <laughs> Interesting there. <laughs> but we see how this plays out. Yeah. Many thanks for your time. And that was my colleague Anodame who just returned from that particular media briefing by those driver unions. And indeed, we are going to delve deeper into this particular issue. We'll be speaking to the National Insurance Commission as well as the Transport Ministry on all these developments on the polls, which airs at 3 p.m. on this very same channel. But away from that, let's talk health. And five suspected cases of meningitis were recorded at the Ridge Hospital in Accra last week. One was confirmed to be the me meningococcal meningitis. However, the other four cases, two from Dansuman and two from Ashaiman, where, uh, well, we are told they are still being tested. Now, today, reports reaching joiners indicate that all four tested negative meningitis. To give us more on this, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Shofenyo, who is the medical director of the Ridge Hospital, will be speaking to him later on, uh, as and when we do have him on the lines. But time now for us to take a break. When we come back, we'll bring you... Okay. So I'm told Dr. Shofenyo is actually on the line now. Let's speak to him and get his thoughts on this particular issue. So, Doc, uh, good afternoon. Many thanks for your time. So, w what is the status of meningitis infections in Accra as we speak? Okay. We, 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 can, we can barely hear you, sir. Yeah. If you could speak up that a bit. In the past, no, it's, uh, so, but I have signed the letters now. So, yeah. the other thing is that if the communication Official. Okay, so we'll, we'll try and work on that particular line and uh, bring back Dr. Shofenyo to tell us much more about the situation, the meningitis infection situation in the greater Accra region. You're watching News Today here on your Joe News channel on Malti TV. We're taking a break. When we come back, we'll bring your business with John and Wakum. And now time for business and financial inclusion appears to have expanded faster, particularly in the rural areas. According to World Bank report, rural access to formal financial services doubled between 2010 and 2015. Daryl Kwao of our business desk has more. Just about 29% of the rural population was yet to have access to financial services as of 2015. This represents a major improvement from the 55% as of 2010 according to the Financial Inclusion Survey by World Bank Think Tank Consultative Group to assist the poor sea gap, access to rural banking for the period under review grew better from 21% to 26% than the national average. But again, this was driven by non-bank formal financial services, which have grown fivefold since 2010. Informal financial services in rural areas, according to the report, also grew by 3% from 18% in 2010, to 21% in 2015. And importers and exporters are warning of massive smuggling of goods across the borders following the implementation of the ECOWAS Regional Common External Tariffs, which took effect today. The implementation of the new tariff follows the passage 
of the Customs Amendment Act, that's Act 905. The ECOWAS tariffs requires that exporters and importers on the sub-region pay same rate for goods and services entering or going out of the member states. The Common External Tariffs replaces the harmonized systems and customs tariff schedules of Samson Awingo is the executive secretary of the Exporters and Importers Association. The issue is that our problem is that some of the percentages they give, as Dr. narrated to, mm. to you, is 0% from citrus product, 5% yeah. if you are bringing raw material to do production here, 10%, but that's what the CET approved. If you are bringing mm. rice importation, if you are embark on rice importation, it is 10%. Okay. In Ghana, it is not 10%. Ghana, we are, we are already on 20%. Okay. Ghana could not go back to tell CET, uh, CET that, well, we are already taking 10%, uh, 20%. So, by Ordinarily, if it's about trade fairness, mm. we think that Ghana should have also gone, if they implemented the 35% on other commodities, just like he made mention, but he did not I don't forget, we, we remember Ghana at the moment, as we speak, we have poultry, uh, uh, poultry and the best flute left and right. The last time, the Volta region, uh, I, I think recently, two months ago, it was in the uh, this Greater Accra or uh, the Asante region. There was bad flute. Mm. We, they've gone, Ghana so, have what, what, uh, so, fi fi so finally, what do you want to change here? Just in, what in we want seconds. to do is that the, we are very close with uh, Avricos. Avricos with a 35% on tomato paste, uh, that's what the CET says should be implemented. Tomato paste, meat importers, uh, water, uh, yogurt, and, uh, that would fall within the pepsin and stuff like that. Mm. It is 35%. But Avricos went back to because they said no. With their economy, they are borrowing at a length of 3.3%. We are borrowing at 27, 26%, 27%, 28% from our banks. Okay. Importers are paying so many loans, and it's 35%. And right. Avricos is clearing at 20%. They have gone for 20%, and we are implementing. 35 percent is going to create where is the fairness here we are talking about so you and that will be it for business my name is john kojo amwako And that's how we wrap up on news today this afternoon here on your Joy News channel on Multi TV. My name is Kwabna Chen Chen Hinebwati. Remember, there's a lot more news when you visit myjournalline.com. Coming up next is the marketplace with John Amakom. Have a good afternoon.